Welcome, and thank you for joining us here at Commitment Online, a place for all nations. We want you to fully engage with us, so feel free to gather your family, invite a friend, or if you're alone, we trust that you'll have a wonderful worship experience with us today. Our worship service will begin in just a few minutes. bringing us safely have your way father in everything that we sing that we worship you with father every word 
Let it resonate in our hearts, Father, as we worship you.
have rescued one more time say you have rescued my life you have rescued my life and I'll never Father we are always growing and always going we the church the people are always mourning but always building from the ground up a firm foundation because together we rise together we are one we are the light and we are the salt through christ we are that sweet smelling aroma lingering even after we are gone father be the fragrance of change of healing and deliverance of grace and mercy, of wisdom and power, of everything pure and holy, the fragrance of freedom in you, Lord. Just breathe a fresh anointing and fire we want to receive so that we may unashamedly teach what is good in godliness submissiveness but not naiveness father help them to know who they are and whose they are women you see wretched he sees worthy you see lost and dirty but he sees found and covered a princess his daughter you are special you are chosen you are beautiful you are worth it and worthy you are royalty, you are blameless, you are righteous, you are new and free, created on purpose for a purpose. God's plan that he has for you, to prosper you, to give you a hope for a future of redemption, displaying Christ and his unconditional sacrificial affection, for you are called to be his workmanship. A masterpiece we are all called to be his church time to build
church on the side of ground. Oh.
God, we thank you so much for the finished work of Jesus Christ, um, because it is by him and through him and because of him and for him we do all things. Thank you for the finished work of Jesus that equips a mother to uh, love her family and be committed to them all the days of her life. And God, as we celebrate moms, I pray you would encourage them. But also I pray that you would encourage those who may be uh, missing their mother. Lord, uh, during this time, there's mixed emotions uh, about this day. And I pray you provide healing to them and uh, that they will uh, know, God, that you're faithful still in absence of their mother. So, Spirit of God, please come and work in me, that you may work through me to accomplish all that you desire in every heart and every home today. Lord, we love you. We thank you so much for your finished work. In Jesus' name, amen. So today, of course, is Mother's Day, and um, it's very easy just to present a message only for mothers. But what I desire to do is this, is... First, thank you so much for all that you do and all that you are to us and uh, your family. But I want to also uh, say that it's interesting that uh, every woman, God has created this inherent um, desire or inclination to mother, right? Uh, and any mother, you could be a mother who is desiring to be a mother. You may be a woman who would never be a mother but something in you inherently God has given you to, to care and to nurture. Uh, so that being said, instead of saying today, we're gonna speak specifically to mothers, I wanna open the landscape and say, let's speak to all the women because there is a responsibility, I believe, that God has given every woman and that is to be a nurturer and caring uh, for others. So uh, that being said, what I reveal to you today is, is this, is that we desperately, as a church, need women like you that we will uncover uh, during our time together. Uh, I would like to categorize you this way. We need women with super character and who are also super models. All right. In other words, you may never walk a runway, right, uh, displaying uh, yourself, right, and or the clothing that you may wear, uh, or some uh, new fashion or style, but what you will do is walk this runway called life. And all eyes will be on you, and all eyes will be expecting something from you. And my desire is to give you uh, the tools and are a challenge to be able to say, okay, you know what? I'm willing to embrace this super character and this supermodel responsibility that, that God has given all women. So that being said, can you open your Bibles first to 1 Timothy chapter 2? We will only be in verses 9 and 10 in 1 Timothy. Uh, the Bible verses will also be on the screen today. Uh, then we'll flip over to Titus chapter 2, verses 3 through 5. But first, it's going to be in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. And, and we're going to uh, begin by describing your needed character in the church. What is that character that is needed by you. Now, what I want to also say as you, you're navigating and trying to find this portion of scripture is that it's going to say older women. <laughs> so don't cancel yourself out and say, well, I ain't old, you know, <laughs> but you are older than someone else, right? In other words, you may be 20, but you're older than someone who's 19, 18, 17, right? You, you may be a young adult. You can be a model, a role model, right? You could be someone who displays the character of a woman to a teenager, to a child, right? Or you may never be a mom on this side of heaven. But there's a young girl that's around you with her eyes on you. Let me even tell you this. There's a young man whose eyes are on you who says, oh, this is the woman I should look for in a wife. You will help your sons, you will help your nephews, you will help your young cousins, you will help your little brothers know how to identify a woman that he should find. Amen? So again, when you look at this, I want you to broaden your landscape rather than saying, well, hey, sucks, I ain't 65 years old, so or I'm not 70, or I'm not 80, I'm not my grandparents' age, so that doesn't apply to me. No, if you're older than someone, it applies to you. Make sense? 
All right, that being said, again, 1 Timothy chapter 2, beginning at verse number 9. It says, likewise, likewise meaning he said something to the men, which we'll cover on Father's Day, <laughs> right? Likewise, I want women to adorn themselves with proper clothing, modestly and discreetly, uh, not with braided hair. Now, please don't blow a gasket. If you braid your hair, doesn't mean that you're bad. Or if you wear nice clothing, doesn't mean that you're bad. We're going to get into all of that. It says in gold or pearls or expensive apparel, but rather by means of good works, as is proper for women, making a claim to godliness. All right, now let's dig deeper. So this character that I will describe to you, I'm just going to give you two points today. The first is this, found in verse number nine. The church, or what we've been learning in this sermon series, the ecclesia need women adorned with humility. You may say, well, I'm not not humble. Let's go deeper. It says, likewise, I want women to adorn themselves. The word adorn themselves or the word adorn means this, to embellish with honor or gain honor. In other words, when you put clothing on or when you dress yourself from the outside, when you care for yourself from the outside, it is never or should never be to attract attention to yourself. In other words, an honor that is reserved for God and God alone. Okay, you're tracking with me, hopefully. But then it says it should be modestly. The word modestly means this. It should be, ba there's this bashfulness, reverence, or regard to others, or this respect. So as you're clothing yourself and adorning yourself, there should be this, no, I don't wear this. I don't do this. I don't color my hair, dye my hair, paint my nails, or paint my toenails in my sock, in my shoe for me or to attract attention to me. Because the challenge is this, ladies, is that if there's this need to say, let me look this way on the outside so I can feel better on the inside, there's something missing on the inside. And all honor and glory is to be whom? God and God alone, right? So it says discreetly, or it should be with soundness of mind or self-control. So flip the other side of the coin. <laughs> if I have a tendency to, again, embellish and, and attract too much attention to myself, so much so that it, I only feel good when I'm wearing this, looking this way, hair color this way, or X, Y, Z, then there's this um, beginning to become a person who has lost self-control. I'm out of control. Now, braided hair doesn't mean that you're bad if you go on vacation in Jamaica and you get your hair braided and, or if you like just the sports braids every now and then because you're tired of combing your hair or something like that, right? But what this really meant was in the first century Roman culture, women would customarily braid or twist their hair high on their heads, often decorating their locks with jewels, gold ornaments, and more to garner attention to themselves. So what, what it's really saying is, don't do this. Matter of fact, don't do anything to garner attention on yourself. Yes, you, yeah, absolutely. Look beautiful, you know, smell good, and, and, and care for yourself on the outside, right? Super important to do so. But it should not be motivated by some inward void. It shouldn't be to attract attention to yourself, but it should be, okay, God, I'm doing this and I'm doing it this way because I'm already good on the inside. And we're going to learn that. I'm already adorned on the inside and I feel good on the inside first before I need something on the outside to make me feel good. Where? on the inside, and then if it's, if it's the latter, it then says, I'm drawing attention to myself rather than what? Attention to God. Let's go further. First Peter chapter three, verses three and four, describes your primary adornment, and this hopefully will crystallize it in your heart. It says, your adornment must not be merely the external, there's braid and hair again, right? And we understand what that means. Wearing gold jewelry, we now understand what that means. Doesn't mean your husband can't buy you jewelry, you can't buy jewelry for yourself. Does not mean that, period, okay? It says our putting on apparel. But it should be what? 
the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is precious in the sight of whom? That's the motive. That's your aim. Right? If your aim is, God, I just want my soul to look good. I want my, my soul to overflow with beauty. Then you know what that, that would happen? On the outside, you have self-control. On the outside, you won't need to do something to attract attention. Here's, here's another thought. You won't have to do that to attract attention to a man to love you. You won't have to do that to attract attention to your wife to love you more. Truth be told, you know what? Yeah, maybe you may catch my eye with how you look on the outside, but you'll keep my heart by who you are on the inside. Ask any man. Yeah, your beauty may cause me to look, but who you are on the inside will keep my eyes on you and you alone. Spend more time on the inside. Make sense? And then God will show you how you should look on the outside. Make sense? He will allow you to be content in who you are on the outside. And you won't be comparing yourself with runway models and pictures in a magazine, which honestly are all photoshopped. So, again, the church needs women with this character that is adorning themselves with humility. Right? And humility and summary is simply put eyes on him, not on me. Glorify him, not me. It's about him, not ourselves. But then verse 10 gives us this. The church need women to adorn themselves with good works. So think about this. Instead of I want attention to be drawn to me by what I look like, but on the contrary, when we do good works and do works for God, then attention also is turned on whom? God. So let's look at this. It says, but rather by means of good works, as is proper of women making a claim to be godly, to, to, to be of what? Godliness. So think about that for a minute, ladies. If I'm saying I'm godly, that means what should come along with it are godly works. The word good, good works, it means of good nature, useful, helpful, Pleasant works, agreeable, joyful, excellent works, distinguished, upright, honorable. So it's kind of saying this to you and I, uh, ladies in particular. It's saying, you know, if you say you're godly, there's something that you should be doing for God. Which you tie that into the church. It is super important for women to find their role and their place in the church. To know that you have value, to know that there's something that God has called and created you to do that he wants to put on display for his glory. So your challenge will always be, okay, well, am I spending so much time on me, 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 and losing sight of him, 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 which ultimately brings glory to him. So Matthew, or Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 5, verse 16. It says, your light must shine before people in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in what? There's a good work. Ephesians talk about this. There's a good work that he's created uh, for you before you were even born. Before the foundations of the world, there's a good work for you. So your challenge is this. Am I working in the kingdom? Am I working in the body of Christ? If I'm not working in the body of Christ and I'm working for the kingdom of God, chances are there's some kind of selfish, self-centeredness that is going on in, in one's life. Now, it may be this. Well, I got to just keep the family together. And I don't have time. We're going to get into that later as well. Well, you know, I don't have time because I'm working, I'm, I'm doing this at home, and, and, and therefore there's no necessarily good works that, what, glorify God. There are works that may be good, you follow me? You're doing good things in a home, good things in a marketplace, but does it necessarily bring glory to him? The church needs women who adorn themselves down the runways of life with humility 
women who adorn themselves with good works. In other words, God, there is something you made me for. Find it. Find it. Find it and say, God, let me flourish in this. Find peace in this. Find joy. Let it be in a way that is helpful and useful and nurturing and joyful and it's honorable to you and it glorifies you. Amen? Amen. So we not only need your character in the church, we also need you to play a specific role. And again, remember, it's not only for the older women, but if you are older than someone, if you're sitting in the sanctuary and you are preteen, well, guess what? You have a responsibility for the kids' kids. If you are a teenager, you have a responsibility for preteens, younger. If you are retired, guess what? And you say, oh, I'm done raising you know, kids. Uh, no, you're not. You're not. Because there will always be babies in the body of Christ that need you to mother them. That's just the way God created it. So there's a role in the church. Can you with me? Uh, turn with me, excuse me, to uh, Titus chapter 2. Is this making sense? I hope. And as we get deeper, please underscore, I didn't write this. He did. <laughs> <laughs> Just sad. I just a disclaimer, you know, it's like, hey, I'm only tell you what he told me to tell you based upon what he's written to all of us, okay? So don't be mad at me. Take it up with God. All right. <laughs> all right. All right. So uh, Titus chapter 2, uh, verses 3 through 5. It says, Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in their behavior, not malicious gossip, nor enslaved to much wine, teaching what is good, so that they may encourage the young women to love their husbands, to love their children. And it's weird that he say that women need to be taught to love their husbands and love their children. And it could be because every now and then you want to go on strike. <laughs> you would be like, can I, give, can I punt them back to you, God? You know, it's like... Return to sender. <laughs> All right. It says to be sensible, pure, workers at home, kind, being subject to their own husbands or submit to their own husband so that the word of God will not be dishonored. You hear that? Again, it's about his glory. So the word of God are not, is not being dishonored. So here's about three things I like to give you when it comes to your needed role within the church. Uh, the church needs women to model reverent behavior reverent behavior it says older women likewise are to be reverent in their behavior and it gives some descriptions not malicious gossips nor enslaved to much wine the word reverent means this actions are sacred things to god again it just continue to affirm that your actions are it's like this sweet smelling aroma that that reaches the nostrils of god Behavior means this. It's demeanor, your attitude, your character, kind of your whole emotional makeup, right? It's like, what's your demeanor? What's your attitude in all of this? What's your character looking like? This behavior should be reverent. And here's a tough one. It says, not malicious gossips. Now, this word malicious, look, listen to what it means. It's the Greek word, and some of you who are, who are uh, Spanish-speaking Diablo, diablos, it means what? Meaning slanderous, accusing falsely, opposing the cause of God. So when you gossip on the phone and you're just giving your opinion, it is opposing the cause of God. It also says this, it may be said to act the part of the devil or to side with him. You can kind of say it this way. When gossip is on your lips, all it does is tear down, destroy, decay, and it doesn't help anybody, including yourself. And then here's a tough one, and, and we're gonna, I gotta pause on this next one and drive some data home, okay? It says, you shouldn't be enslaved to much wine, which means to make a slave of reduced to bondage. Now, 
if someone is in bondage to something, you know what it simply means. You can't live without it. So if you're a person or a woman who says, well, you know, I just got to wind down from the day, have my glass of wine. Well, you know, I just had that glass of wine. It just causes me just to, whew, allows me to sleep better, just allows me to navigate life. Man, the kids are all crazy and jumping all over me, pulling on me, and I just get away, just take a hot bath and just give me a glass of wine, and that just smooths everything out, and now I can go to bed. You're enslaved to it. Slavery is simply this. If you need anything else other than Jesus, you're in bondage to it. If you need the, the affirmation of your children more than you need God's affirmation, you're in bondage. If you need your husband, if you need your family's affirmation, if you need your employment or whatever it may be to affirm your womanhood, you are in bondage to it. If you can't rest at night without doing something other than something that connects your heart more intimate with Jesus, you're in bondage. He's the only one who has the privilege to own you. He's the only one who owns you. But I want to give you some information. So this kind of sent me on a, on a search, and I found a couple of articles. The first article is this. More women in the U.S. are drinking themselves to death. Two it says two decades of data from the Center for Disease Control and Prevention shows that women's alcohol-related mortality is rising at a faster rate. They found that women's alcohol-related mortality rate rose by 14.7% when this article was written, as compared to men who rose at 12.5%. In another article, and you're gonna, you're gonna probably recognize the name. It says, what is wine mom culture? Listen to some of the, the information here. It says that there's 713,000 members strong Facebook group. So I researched it. It's now at 1.8 million Facebook group called Moms Who Need Wine. You've probably heard it says and seen the sayings on coffee mugs and tote bags, mommy needs her juice. I wine because my kids wine. Companies have created wine spouts that mothers can hide in their purses. <laughs> the article goes on to say this, although it's a relatively new term, wine mom culture refers to the growing number of wine moms who encourage drinking to escape from the daily stresses of parenthood. According to Psychology Today, a secular institution, but keep in mind, it's not a Christian saying this, which to me gives it more credence. It's not a Christian trying to talk you out of this. You follow me? So Psychology Today says there are a few primary reasons why alcoholic mothers drink. Instant gratification and stress relief. Number two, lack of support, they say. If alcoholic, if alcoholic mothers can't find a babysitter or afford daycare when they need it, they may feel the need to drink. The third is this, not enough me time. Moms may not find time for self-care while they're looking after their children. Okay, here's number four, which blew me out of water. Again, a secular company or organization is saying this, rebellion. Drinking is an exciting experience for many. Once a woman reaches motherhood, she has to take one more responsibilities, take on, excuse me, more responsibilities, leaving less time for being spontaneous and irresponsible. So it's like, hey, I'm just doing it because I just want to do it. Lastly, mental health issues. 
mothers who suffer from depression or anxiety are at an even higher risk of becoming alcoholics. They may drink wine to self-medicate and temporarily ease their pain. If you have to have it, it has you. The church need women who conduct themselves reverently because all eyes are on you. Number two, you find in verse number three in Titus chapter two, the church need women to model goodness. To model goodness. It says teaching what is good. So think about this for a minute. You can't teach anything that you're not what? Doing. You ever hear the statement, you know, do as I do, uh, do as I say, but not as I do, right? That, that never works for any family, right? Because <laughs> inherently your, your children, our children would do exactly what we do, even if we're doing it on a down low. That's the weird thing. <laughs> they may not even see you doing it, but somehow they catch on to what you're doing, even when you're not even doing it in front of them. And that's how spiritual it is, honestly. So the challenge is to be a person who understands that it is my responsibility to, to teach what is good or it, that definition of teaching what is good is that I'm a teacher of goodness. That how I live is instructing everybody around me. How I conduct myself is teaching my children how to be good. How I, how I model goodness and live goodness and live the right way is on display by, you know, before everybody we know, everybody who has eyes on you, in the home or even outside of the home, your immediate family or even your external family, the family of God or even sinners. Your life is on clear display to be, always be teaching, always be teaching by how you live. Amen? So the church need women, again, who model this reverent behavior, but we need women who model goodness. It's just your life is exactly how God has instructed it to be. Doesn't mean you're going to not fail. Doesn't mean that you're not going to hit a speed bump. Doesn't mean that you're not going to need help by, by other sisters in the body of Christ. But that's the body of Christ. And that's the benefit of being around other sisters who are trying to do the same thing you're doing. But you have to set the bar where the bar is. You follow me? The bar can't be lowered because you're going through a difficult season in life. The bar can be lowered. Listen, even if your husband or people around you are not at the bar. Your responsibility is to be a model of goodness and teach it wherever you go. Then lastly, you find in verses 4 through 5 in Titus chapter 2. The church need women, listen to this, to model domestic dedication. Now, don't throw apples and oranges and shoes and purses because here's the deal. There's going to be some things that we talk through in this last point that God said, not me. God said, not me. And we need to also understand that, that we live in a world that pushes back on what God says and what God said it should be and how God built things, right? Not based upon how we said it should be, but it's about how God built it. And the way he constructs things are perfect. It's perfect. So our challenge is to say, okay, well, God, I may not be doing exactly what you're saying, but that must be my aim. Or your challenge, ladies, will always be this, is that, well, wait a minute, you don't understand. I have this big load that I'm carrying. I'm going to defer not to doing what God says. Well, he's not helping me. The kids don't get me. Everybody's working against me, so I'm not going to do it. Or, here's a tough one. He's working, you're working. But then you have to still come home and do some domestic stuff. Right? Now, granted, here's the deal. However you work that out in your family is however God tells you to work it out in your family. But from a biblical standpoint, what God says to a man is that you should be the primary keeper. Of, of the, the resource making, right? And this is what even non-believing financial advisors says. 
do not make purchases that you need both incomes. You know why? It's because inherently in a woman, this is what happens, right? If she's a young woman, she starts having kids, and then now she says things like this, well, I don't leave the kids. Because something in her says, I got a mother, I have to mother, I have to mother. And so there's this challenge and tension that occurs in families and mothers' hearts. It's like, okay, well, I'm forced to do this in some cases. Not saying all cases. There's some guys who do have the audacity to say, you have to do this. Absolutely wrong. God is the one who says, you have to do this. They have the privilege to do this based upon the context of the home. You follow me? Make sense? So because a woman will go through life and start feeling resentful, like, well, why do I have to keep carrying this load that's not meant for me to carry? Because I'm not wired to carry it. Then now I feel tension of, well, I'm dropping my kid off to someone who now they grow up and say mommy before they say mommy to me. I remember my sister dropping off her daughters and her daughter called my mother mom before she called her own mom mom. That's the real tension that begins to happen in families. A woman should have the privilege to provide, not the responsibility to provide. So therefore, there, is, there are decisions in the context of a family when she starts feeling the tension, there has to be communication to say, well, how are we going to navigate this? Something then has to change. You can't live above your means, so then you have to shift certain things to stay according to the will of God, or things will begin to collapse around you, and then, then roles begin to be confused. It's just making, hopefully, some sense. So that being said, when you look at this domestic responsibility or this domestic dedication, it doesn't mean, okay, every house should be like this. But in theory or theologically proper, every house should be like this to some degree. But you have to work through the tension because what normally happens is a husband and a wife hits this intersection, they don't communicate, and then, interesting enough, it says, teach the women how to love their husbands because women would stop liking their husbands and then fall out of love. Just like you come home and you're like, the kids, they, they're, nobody helps me, nobody gets, and then begins to resent the children and fall out of love even with their children because there needs to be hard conversations to say, how does it look for us? And then once you do that, then you roll with God, what God commands, so that they may encourage the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be sensible, pure workers of home, at home, kind, being subject to their own husbands, so that the word of God will not be dishonored. The word domestic, the Oxford Dictionary defines as this, relating to running of a home or a family relations. Listen, moms, ladies, you are the heartbeat. Yes, God called us the head of the house, of the home, of the family, but you are the heartbeat. How do I know that? Let a mom get sick and see what happens. I don't care how good a guy is. It's just something you just have a skill set that we just don't have to be able to multitask, you know, see things and operate properly in a home and hold them together. And we can, we can try to run a close second. But let mom get sick. It'd be like, oh, dang, what do I do? You know, where do I find this? Oh, I can't find it. You know, where, where, you know, where, 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 you know, where's the salt? Well, where it was last week. <laughs> <laughs> did you look? Oh, yeah, I look. And you go back in there. Wait, wait a minute. How did it appear? Right? It's just something about the heartbeat of the woman. 
And to me, that shows value. It doesn't say, oh, you're second fiddle, you're less than. It says if you're not functioning well, it ain't going to go well. Now, here's the challenge. You functioning well doesn't mean you run everything. (laughs) Which could look like this. Let it fall apart. So he can grow up and be a man. Here's a novel idea. If you get so tired, don't cook. God, God, yeah, I mean, seriously, it may mean, ladies, if you are so worn out and you've been caring for the family and if you're bivocational, meaning that you're working outside the home and inside the home and you dog tired, what's wrong with that? Hey, baby, there's leftovers. Heat them up. There is, there is nothing wrong with that. Why? It's because you know what will begin to happen. You'll begin to resent him and not love him. Resent the kids. Resent your calling. You'll begin to push back on God and say, this ain't fair, God. Well, why do I? Why do I? Why do I? And then now you... <laughs> the whole house is all messed up because you're bad. <laughs> I mean, you know, it, that's the reality. You know, it, it's, you get mad and it's like, dang, what did I do? I didn't do anything wrong. Well, maybe I did. And you need to speak into it, moms, right? Listen, sweetheart, family, for me to honor God and not dishonor his word, I got to speak up. This is just too heavy for me. I need Johnny, Larry, Sue, Mary, I know you're eight years old, but you're going to learn how to wash. Here's the vacuum. Turn the button on and just move your arm. <laughs> you know, how, how, whatever you need to communicate so you're not resenting what God has called and created you specifically to do. You follow me? Because truth be told, let's be real. <laughs> We were never clean like you were clean. We were never vacuumed like you were vacuumed. We were never cared for the kids like you care for because we're not you and we're not wired that way. Again, no matter how good a guy can get at this, there's just something that a woman brings to it that's totally, totally, totally different and totally, totally godlike. And if you're struggling with doing that, you got to speak into it and say, family, I need your help. This is out of balance. Help me here so I don't get frustrated and not like you anymore and want to return to cinder. All right? <laughs> and that's why if you look at a couple of key words, we're going to close this. The word encourage means to restore one to his senses. <laughs> there may be a friend lady that calls you, you need to just talk to them, talk them off the ledge to restore them to your senses. Or maybe one day you need a phone call to be curbed. To hold on to your duty as a woman. To be discipled. Do you see the key, that definition of the key word? When you're encouraging each other you're modeling this and you're speaking into each other's life, you may restore someone who's like, ah, I just don't want to do this anymore. Ah, I just don't want to do this anymore. Ah, I just feel like quitting, giving up. There may be someone you just need to curb. Is that okay? says, chill, calm down. I get it. You're all emotional right now. It's going to get better. There may be someone you literally need to disciple and just say, follow me as I follow Christ. Let me show you how to love your children. Let me show you how to love your husband. Let me show you how to do this thing in the home. If not, it says, so that the word of God will not be dishonored. Make sense? You need each other's help. Got to lean on each other so that no one 
dishonors the word of God. Amen? So here's a challenge. There are so many women, it may not be you or maybe you today, that have been robbed of their precious God-intended identity. It could be because you never saw how it should be done. It could be that you've been forced to act a certain way. It could be that you have been manipulated by everything you've heard around you and saw around you in this world. Uh, and there's some who don't even understand their, their role in society. They're, and the truth be told in all this, the, the struggle that you go through is difficult for you to embrace and even men to embrace and even the world to embrace what God has really called and created you to, to do and to be within the home and even within the church. Which leads to this, that there are so many moms and women who are just flat out stressed out. And if it wasn't for Jesus, you'd probably be thrown in the towel. If, what, if, you, if you, truth be told, if you love your kids more than your husband, you probably wouldn't be there. And that's the reality. Because there's some men I've personally known come home and the whole family's gone. She didn't say a word. She just left. Because she was in over her head and just done with it all. So our challenge is to understand all of this is that this will stress you out to a point that you start turning to other vices. You will. I mean, it, it happens to the best. But with all of this in mind, you need to know today that you are loved and God's beloved daughter. You are beloved by God, period. Secondly, you need to know I love you personally, and you need to know there's a whole bunch of guys, of men of commitment who love you as well, and they put it on display, I believe, in a very profound way, in a mature way, on Friday, that you are loved, period. So don't get it twisted and think that there's some other option and things like that. But here's the part about it, in all of it, is that you're needed and you're needed to step into everything I share with you today within this church. You are needed to be that, that beautiful model on the runway of life so that generation of women can look at you and say, wow, that's the standard. That's the standard. You need it. I can't do it. No matter how hard I would try, or truth be told, I can only and should only go so far. You follow me? So therefore, it, it's your responsibility and, and that you have to want to step into it and say, hey, look at me, watch me. And therefore, I want to give you this final verse, which I, I know many of you probably know already, but I think it's important just to apply to today. And there's this verse I like to say, it has a dual response. It's a dual response text. In other words, it means this, is that it offers you the privilege to be influenced and or be the influencer. In other words, I can read this text and say, oh yeah, I desperately need someone that I can see, that I can hear. But then it may be, no, 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 look at me and follow me as I follow Christ. Philippians chapter 4, verses 8 and 9, it says this. Finally, and it's so sweet, our God just shows his word. It says, finally, brothers and what? Sisters. Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if anything worthy of praise, think about these. So as you're lying in the bed, you're staring up at the ceiling at night, and if you're married and your husband's snoring right next to you, like, you know, he just fell asleep in a second, you know, a millisecond. <laughs> Think about what is true, 
what is honorable, what is right, what is pure, what is lovely, what is commendable, what is excellent. If there's anything worthy of praise, think about this. Don't let your mind, you know, go any other place. But this is where this responsibility kind of heightens in verse 9. Ask for the things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me. Practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. In other words, and God will remove the stress. So your challenge would be, God, who can I learn from? Who can I receive from? Who can I hear? Who can I see? Who's practicing these things that I can duplicate what they're practicing? And guess what God promises? Peace. Who can learn from you? Who can receive from you? Who can hear you, see you, and then they can emulate you? These are the kind of ladies we need in our church. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we're so thankful for our mothers, for our ladies. As a man, I know I confess publicly that I need them. Quite honestly, church would be absolutely boring without them. And God, I just pray that you would just continue to encourage their hearts. Help them, Lord, to focus on the good things you're doing. God, I pray if they need to have conversations with their husbands, their families, their friends, God, that you'll give them the courage and the wisdom to talk through things. Because, Lord, they're not meant to carry it all. Instinctively, inherently, they will do it, but they are not wired to carry it all. Lord, but yet you wire them to love and nurture everybody connected to them. Lord, I pray you give them wisdom to how to balance all that out so they will not grow fatigued in doing what they should be doing. God, I pray in the name of Jesus that there will be no vices that they turn to. I pray, God, that you will break bondage of anything that maybe any of my sisters or anyone has turned to other than you, Jesus. Thank you for joining us here at Commitment Online, a place for all nations. If you're ever in the Philadelphia, Delaware, or South Jersey region, we hope to see you in person. But for now, Please tune in next week here at Commitment Online.